Do you have a heart? Do you have a passion, a longing to see the unsaved to be saved? To see those who are lost, who don't know Jesus like we know him, and to see them found. Those who are dead spiritually to become alive. Do you acknowledge that it's a good thing? And if, if it was on the ballot, you'd vote thumbs up? Or does it become personal? Is it a desire that you have? Lord, I want to see those who are lost saved. If you're not sure about that answer, if you have that great desire, then I encourage you to do a heart check. And in fact, it's good for all of us to do a heart check from time to time. Because the Bible teaches us and gives us examples of why it's so important to have a passion to see those who do not know God come to a knowledge of God, a saving knowledge of Jesus. I always get motivated and even convicted by some of the examples in the Bible of those who had a passion to see the unsaved become saved. I think of the Apostle Paul. He, he wrote these words down. He said, God, you know I'm not lying when I say this, that I would, if it were possible, I would give up my own salvation and be sent to hell myself if it meant that my brothers would be saved. Oh, wow. There's a passion to see the lost saved. I think of Peter and John who were preaching about Jesus and they were arrested and thrown in prison and this was recently after they had just seen Jesus crucified. So they knew what getting thrown in prison and arrested could mean. They were thrown in prison, arrested. And it says, during the night, an angel came and unlocked the doors and said, I want you guys to go out and go back to the temple courts and to preach this good news all over again. Now, if I were in Peter and John, I would have said, Hold on, I just went through a very traumatic experience. I just got arrested and thrown in prison. I need at least two weeks just to kind of process this and digest this and then maybe come back to me. But he said, no, I want you to go back and preach because there are people who need to be saved. <laughs> what dedication and passion. But looking at Paul and Peter and John and the prophets and the disciples is good. But when it comes to passion for the lost, the best example of all is our Lord himself, is our heavenly father. And tonight I want to talk about the lengths that our father in heaven goes to, to draw people to himself. And though maybe it's not a sermon that is a, you need to go and do this and this, I believe it'll encourage your faith to pray and to believe and to see the unsaved in a new way and to say, God, you said in your word that you were going to draw them. And I heard it on a Wednesday night and there was scriptures. So I pray and believe and looking for opportunities on ways that I can be a part of the process to see those people who do not know you to be drawn to you. I've asked five volunteers to come and to help me tonight. They can line up right here beside me on the stage. Uh, it is Josh and Yusuf, and Phil, and Rachel, and Mark Halleck. Just line up right here. Thanks so much, guys. Kind of just side by side, shoulder to shoulder. These are just a visual illustration of unsaved people. Don't they look hopeless? Oh, don't they look sad? These people, they, they need Jesus. They do. And they do. No, they, they really do. But no, for our illustration tonight, just real simply to, to introduce this sermon, these are going to represent five unsaved people. Five random people in your life, from your workplace, your school, your neighborhood, your extended family, your immediate family, five unsaved people. I'm going to tell you some facts about these people, these five random people. The first fact about each one of these five is this, that they are on their way to an eternity without God. The Bible calls it hell. They're on their way to it. It doesn't matter how much they give to charity or how nice they are at home or how hardworking they are or, you know, if they, if they have puppies and kitty cats at home and they love them with all their heart. No, it doesn't matter how soft-hearted or nice they are. Without Christ, without receiving Jesus, each five is destined to an eternity without him and is on their way to that. Here's the second fact is that for each one of these five, it is the Father's will that they be saved. Some of us kind of think this. We think that God walks down the line and says, you, it's my will that you're saved. It's my will that you're saved. 
Nope, no, nope, no, sorry, not you. I'm still thinking about you. And we're like, God's already kind of, he's, he's got a couple on his list and a couple knows and he's already pre-decided. No, the Bible says over and over again, look at this verse in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some consider slowness, but he is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish. He's not willing like, oh, well, them's the breaks. No, he wants every single one to come to salvation. Okay, now we've established they're all on their way to hell without Jesus. But God's will is for each one of them to be saved. But here's the next fact. Because it is, it is his will that each of them get saved, God, the Father, is working right now while they still have breath in their body to draw them to himself. He's working, he's working, he's working. He's thinking, how can I draw this one? He's whispering to this one's ear. He's using somebody to minister to this one. He's drawing this one. He's arranging circumstances in this one's life. He's, he's using someone else to plant seeds here. And then he's doing it again and again and again. The Father is drawing these ones. No man can come to me, Jesus said, unless they're drawn by the Father. And so the Father is working. I love this verse from 2 Samuel 14. It says, our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Oh, well, instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. These five who have been separated from the life of God, born into sin, God is devising ways. How can I draw them to myself? How can I? How can I? Now, we said it's God's will. And he's working to draw these to himself. But remember this, in the end, remember this, in the end, all five must each make their own choice, right? Though the father draws them, though he, though he tries, though he plants seeds and sends people to their life, each must make their own choice. Remember the story of the banquet that the master made? And he sent out invitations, personal invitation, personal, 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 personal. And this woman said, no, 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 yes, yes. Each person in the end must make their own choice on what, how to respond. But this is true, that when God sent out the invitations, he had each one in mind. It was his will that all five attended the banquet. Some would make excuses. So we're not saying tonight, just because it's God's will that everyone is saved, that that we have this universalism and everyone on earth is going to be saved. Hell, is, hell will be empty and heaven will be filled with every single person who ever lived. No, no, the Bible says that each person must make their own choice. But tonight, I want you to know this, that God is intent on drawing the unsaved to himself. Thank you, each one of you. Appreciate that. You can take a seat tonight. So tonight, I hope that your passion is stirred as you look at how much God works to draw the unsaved to himself. I hope that you, this encourages you to pray for the lost, to, to see them in a new way, no matter how hopeless they may look, and to believe that as you partner with God, he will use you to minister to the lost. Number one, we're going to look at six ways tonight. The Father draws the lost by the witness of creation. By the witness of creation, something that people cannot escape or run away from is the world in which we live, the universe in which he's placed us, and it itself is a witness that God is real and that he is calling them to himself. Psalm 19 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The Bible tells us clearly this truth, that each person who wakes up and who sees a sunrise, who sees storm clouds gather, who looks up into a starry night sky, something whispers to their heart an undeniable truth it's laid upon their heart that says, this could not have been by mistake. No matter how much evolutionary theory they learned about in school, there's something that whispers to their heart, this newborn baby could not have just happened by accident. 
This is the work of a great designer. And not just some kind of designing force, but verse number one says that it declares the glory of God himself. Proclaim the work of his hands. Creation itself is a revealer of knowledge and understanding about God and his truth and his reality. Isn't that encouraging to us that we can say, Lord, you have already set into place such a great witness. Romans 1.20 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. If someone stands in heaven one day before the, the great judgment throne, the great white throne, and says to God, God, you never gave me a chance. You, you, I, I never knew that there was a God. God will point to this and say, you have no excuse. You lived in the most wonderful, amazing place that was the work of my hands, and it was a witness to your heart, moment after moment after moment. I encourage you, as a witness for Jesus, to use the the truth about creation and God as our creator as an important starting place. You know, without this starting place that God made us and we are the work of his hands, nothing else makes sense. So whether the person that you're speaking to is rich or poor or educated or, or uneducated, always use it as a starting place. Um, in Acts 17, Paul, he's, he walks into Athens, just a, a seat of knowledge in, in, in that day of Greece. And there was a place called the Areopagus where all the smart philosophers would gather and talk about the most cutting edge ideas. And he walks up and says, I have something to say. Could, could I bring some new uh, philosophy, some new beliefs to you? And they said, sure, come on in. And the Bible says that he gets up and preaches a sermon. And for 75% of his sermon, he just talks about God as the creator. That's all he does for 75%. He talks about how God has made each nation and each tongue and each one of us and his hand is in our lives and he made heaven and earth. And he goes on and on and on about it. He doesn't go on about how Jesus was crucified and all that. That would come next. But for that first 75%, he talks about the truth of God as creator. So important for you and I to partner with God in exalting him as creator, the great designer of creation. It is a great witness to those who are unsaved. Number two, our father draws the lost. Remember those five? He draws them by this, by his law inside of their hearts. This is different than creation, his handiwork. This is his truth, his moral law inside their hearts. Romans 2 says, even Gentiles, those who are not of God's chosen people, who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts, either accuse them or tell them you did the right thing. Isn't this beautiful? The Bible says that though we are all born sinners and separated from the life of God, yet God has put into each person's heart, he's written on it, on their conscience, a standard of right and wrong. Two little Two-year-old toddlers in a class, one is playing with the toy, the other comes up and takes it, and the first one goes, hey, you can't do that. We know inside of us, stealing is wrong. That little two-year-old goes and disobeys mommy, and they have a guilt, and they want to hide what they did. Where does that guilt come from, that, that sense of, I did something wrong? It's something that God has placed inside of us, a moral code. Even when we tell a lie, something inside of us changes. You know, even to this day in 2024, lie detector tests are a real thing. They're, they're an established way of, of bringing um, uh, uh, truth to a person and, and further establishing their testimony. What does a lie detector test measure? Our heart rate, our blood pressure, our breathing rate, our perspiration. Something inside of us changes when we know we're not speaking the truth. Why? Because it's written on our hearts by God. That standard built inside of us is a moral standard for all mankind. God, even when sinners are far from him, 
is still trying to teach them and guide them to himself through his law. Psalm 25 verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. These five sitting here, God's coming up and he's whispering to their heart. He's saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Oh, come back to me. I'll show you the way to go. I'll do it. Come back to me. Whispering to their hearts. Oh, he's so good. He's so merciful. Whispering to people's conscience. Never letting them rest. Never letting them have settled peace. There is no rest, says my God for the wicked. That's not some kind of angry curse by God. That's his law in their hearts that says, without me, without following my word, there is no way you can have rest. God's hope is that the lost will recognize that the one greater than themselves has set those laws and that when they break his laws, he's the only one who can provide forgiveness for that guilt. Creation itself and its wonder draws people to God. The law that he written on their heart, that is, he's written on their hearts, draws him. And number three, the father draws the lost by the preaching of the word. If you forget any of the six tonight, don't forget this one, because this is the primary way that the Bible says that people are drawn directly to salvation by the preaching of God's word. This is told and, and exemplified over and over again in the Bible. The Bible says, how shall they hear, how shall they believe unless someone preaches to them? Let's not overthink it and go, well, we don't really have to go out and witness because God's a sovereign God. If he wants them saved, he'll get them. No, 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 no. Unless someone goes, unless someone preaches, the lost will not be drawn as God intends. There is power, power, power in the anointed spoken delivery of God's word. No matter how, how far we go into time, it will never go out of style. God, by his spirit, uses the written word, the, the, the Bible and its truth delivered to people in, through the spoken word to get past people's reasoning and defenses, to touch their soul and their spirit, to cut into their heart and to bring them to a decision point of saying, do I Will I receive Jesus or will I not? In Acts chapter 2, Peter got up and preached a scripture-filled, convicting sermon. And this is how it ended in Acts 2.37. Peter's words pierced their heart, cut them to the heart, and they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? They reached a decision point. That's why it's such a good idea for you and I to not only be a witness to people, but to invite them to church because they, they will be introduced to the simple, profound preaching of the word, the drawing of the spirit by the word. There has been person after person who has come for the first time to church. And I mean, and maybe Pastor B was preaching on the end times or forgiveness or, or the blessed life or any number of topics. And But for the first time in their life, they sat underneath the preaching of the word, the God-ordained preaching of the word, and they could not get to the altar fast enough because they experienced a cutting to the heart that couldn't match anything else. You know, that this proclaiming of the word, though, I'm, though it happens primarily in church, God can do his work at any place and any time. There's one of our girls' ministries teachers downstairs teaching one of the girls' classes. And her testimony is this. It was some years ago that she was sitting home on an afternoon watching her favorite soap opera. She said, I love my soap operas. She's watching her soap opera and suddenly it cuts off the soap opera and on her screen is Billy Graham. And Billy Graham is addressing the, the nation about a recent national event that had happened. And for some reason, the network cut to Billy Graham. And she sat there and listened to Billy Graham speak on the TV screen and by the time he got to the end of his message, she was on her knees in her living room giving her heart to Jesus. Oh, may you and I not limit the proclamation of God's word just to church, though that is the primary place. You and I can be a preacher ready to preach to somebody in their living room or at work or on the sidewalk outside of our house. I love what happened with Philip in Acts 8. It says, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And this is all he said. Do you understand what you are reading? 
And the guy replied, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Do you know that you can be a preacher by simply explaining the scripture to someone? We can quote scripture, and that's good, but to take a scripture and then to explain it to someone? Maybe, maybe you reach a point where someone asks you what you believe, and you say, well, I believe, and the only scripture that comes to your mind is, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And you finish quoting it, and you go, good, good, I witnessed. And you go, no, 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 no. They need someone to explain it to them. You know God so loved the world? Yeah. And you just kind of just, you let the Holy Spirit just kind of touch your heart and you just break it down from there. Our God is a loving God. So many people think of him as this angry, vindictive God and he is holy and just, but he loves. He is love. And he loved the world. He had all the rotten people in and all the sinners and the worst of the worst, including me. God so loved the world, but he didn't just love them with in his heart, but he loved them by giving. And you just explain John 3, 16. And by the time you're done, you just preached a sermon. And God had the chance to draw the lost because of you. Be a preacher. Be a preacher with your words. Number four tonight, he draws the lost by our good words and our conduct. Oh, my brothers and sisters here tonight, those watching online, listen well. If you want to turn someone off from the gospel, if you want to guarantee that someone never even thinks about receiving Jesus ever again, then invoke the name of Jesus on your lips and have a plaque on your car and a verse on your desk at work, but act like everybody else at work with your actions. Talk back to the boss. Talk about him when he's not there. Cheat a little on the numbers. Laugh at the same dirty jokes. Go to the same drinking parties after work. Do those things. And you can guarantee that the people who see you as a Christian say, thanks, but no thanks. If you and I carry the name of Jesus on our lips but don't honor him with our lives, the lost people around us will quickly conclude that being born again, whatever that means, (laughs) is just a hypocritical joke. But here's the good news. Invoke the name of Jesus, speak him, have the verse on your desk, and live for Jesus and honor him. And they will be unable to deny the truth of Jesus. They will say, you know what? I don't really get all that, those Bible verses, and I don't really get it, and I don't know why, you know, you go to church, you know, three times a week, I don't really get all that stuff. But I got to say, there's something different about you. I want to read you some verses and let them speak for themselves about this truth from Scripture, 1 Peter 2.12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see, not hear, but see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The day will come. 1 Peter 3.1. Wives, In the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, I don't want to hear, stop talking to me about those Bible verses, honey. Come on, get them out of my face. I don't want to have family devotions with you. Thanks anyway. They may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Titus 2, servants, you could say employees for us, should be willing to serve their masters, their bosses, at all times. They should try to please them, not argue with them. They should not steal from them, and they should show their bosses that they can be trusted. Then, in everything they do, they will show that the teaching of God, our Savior, is good. Starts with the life, right? And finally, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men. Oh man, I'm a light at work. I'm a light. I'm a light for Jesus. I walk in singing a song. Okay, but that's not what this is talking about. Let your light so shine, and here's your light, that they may see your good works, how you live, your behavior (laughs) at work, and eventually they will glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, we do need to speak about Jesus. His name needs to be on our lips. We do need to walk into work singing a song but let it be that we back it up with our walk, our behavior as well. It's a method that God will use, the Father will use to draw the lost. Two more tonight. Number five, God draws the lost by trial and trouble. 
Oh, it was an excellent sermon by Pastor B this past Sunday. It was entitled, The Sky is Falling. Watch it online. Go to our channel on YouTube or, or, um, or Facebook or that, right there on the archives on our website. Talked about when we as Christians go through trial and what God does through them. I'm going to throw up here a slide from Pastor B's sermon. It said this, the end result of all of our troubles should be that they drive us to seek the face of Jesus. Now, he was speaking to us as Christians. What a good, wise statement that the end result of all of our troubles is that we're like seeking God. We're getting drawn closer to him. And this is true for Christians, but it also has much, much application for the lost and the unsaved. You know why God allows trouble and trial in their lives? With the hopes that they will as well seek the face of Jesus and turn to him also. This is spoken of so many times in scripture. Look with me at just these three consecutive verses in Amos chapter 4. God says, quote, Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your, devoured your fig and olive trees. And I was hoping you'd return to me when I did that, but you didn't return. Verse 10, I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. I was hoping that you'd, you'd seek me and find me through that trouble, but you haven't returned to me. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. If that doesn't do it, what will? You were like a burning snick, a stick snatched from the fire. Yet you haven't returned to me, declares the Lord. Some people say, how could a loving, merciful God do such things? God himself, by his own mouth, said, I sent this. I sent this on your crops, on your, on your families, on your land. I did those things, those terrible, sad things, but for one reason, to save you to save your souls, so that in the hopes that you would return to me. Remember the story of the prodigal son? What a wonderful story of returning and repentance. But there is a turning point in the story. There, there's, a, there's a moment in the story upon which everything hinges. And the turning point of the story is this. While the son was in a far off country, there was a severe famine. Who sent that famine? Oh, well, it was God himself. God said, oh, if I can just send this famine, maybe it will lead this guy to be without a job and be standing in a pig pen and come to his senses. Oh, and it did. You know, that is a truth that should help us to understand and pray for those who are unsaved. And even, and especially for our loved ones, especially for our children, for those that we love, when we see them going through a trouble and trial, Step back and say, God, as much as it hurts me to see them go through that, Lord, are you allowing that, that they might turn back to you and be saved? Wouldn't be surprised if God is, because that's our merciful Heavenly Father. He is not willing that any should perish. Oh, there are so many ways, other ways that the Bible says that the Father draws the lost. The Bible speaks of encounters with Jesus on the road. Signs and miracles that display his power. His loving kindness and tender mercies when people have sinned and rejected him and he still woos them back. But in all these things, in all these ways, the unsaved are drawn to turn from sin and turn to God. The most important one is our final one. It's our core one. It really, it's a thread that goes in throughout all the rest. And it's this, number six. He draws the lost by the stirring of his spirit. When he pours out his spirit. When people pray and believe and say, God, God, you, you, I don't know what to do. Lord, they've gone through trouble and they've, they've hardened their heart and they've done this. And I've invited them to church and I've preached and lived. God, you just got to pour out your spirit. That's when we see in some places and times revival sweep. There's a spirit of supplication and repentance. It's just the Holy Spirit just coming on people and turning their hearts. Jesus told his disciples this. He said, now guys, I'm going to go away. No, Jesus, don't go away. This was just before he would die and, and rise again and ascend to the Father. He said, Jesus, don't go away. Please, we love you here. He said, no, no, no. 
He said, it is good for me to go away because if I go away, I'm going to send the helper to you. They're like, yes, the Holy Spirit is coming from Jesus, from the Father, just for us. What joy. We have a helper in Jesus' place. And that was a one major reason why the Holy Spirit was sent to be our helper. But in the very next verse, John 16, 8, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is also being sent for another reason. When he comes, he is coming for this reason, to convict, to stir, to provoke, to convince the world, all those unsaved people of their sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Isn't that encouraging for us as, as Pentecostals? That the Holy Spirit is poured out on us and the world. Oh, in a different fashion, certainly, but it's a double portion. When you and I go out to witness for Jesus, the Holy Spirit is poured out on us to be empowered and to speak his words. And simultaneously, when we go out, he's being poured out on the people we're witnessing too. The Holy Spirit is coming to work and to stir on their hearts, to convict them, to say, you need to listen to this message. Life isn't going good. There is, there is, this life is short. There's a coming judgment. God is real. And they reach a decision point. You know, this is another reason why you and I need to be so sensitive to the Spirit when it comes to witnessing. Because only the Holy Spirit knows at any moment the inner state of each one who is lost. The one who is being stirred in a special way at that moment by the Holy Spirit. I was reading this this week in my devotions. It says, Paul, he wanted to enter Asia to preach, and the Holy Spirit said, no, they're not ready. He's like, okay, Bithynia. The Holy Spirit said, no. And that night, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come, come, we need you to preach to us. What was Paul sensing? The Spirit was stirring the people in Macedonia. He was convicting them, and they were ready for the message. And he, he concluded that God had sent him there. They had seen their spiritual need, and they were a ready harvest. May we be sensitive to this truth, that the Holy Spirit is the one who stirs people and gets them ready <laughs> and, and prepared to receive Jesus. Let's conclude. In these last days, our Father is not willing that any should perish. Not one of these five. No, he's not picking three and sending two off to hell. No, he's not willing that any should perish. It's his will that all come to repentance. Every unsaved person that you are witnessing to and praying for, you can pray with full assurance in his will. It is God's intent that they become saved. But it's not just God's desire. God is to this day working. John 5, 17, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work this very day. And I too am working. God is stirring their hearts. He's drawing them through creation, through his spirit, through you and me, through our words, through our actions, through the preaching on a Sunday. Oh, he's working. Could you and I almost kind of add to this verse and say, and I am too, Lord. Lord, Lord me, me too, Lord. I'll jump in there. I'll, I'll join in your work, Lord. I don't want to be on the sidelines. Lord, use me. Because God's desire is to draw others. Would you and I join him? If so, let's pray tonight.